volume three chapter nine of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine brings us back as it ought to mrs barnaby it may be thought perhaps that the vexed and as she thought herself the persecuted mrs barnaby had sufficiently tried what a prison was to prevent her ever desiring to find herself within the walls of such an edifice again but such an opinion however likely to be right was nevertheless wrong for no sooner had the widow recovered from the fit of rage into which the triumphant exit of miss compton had thrown her and settled herself on her solitary sofa with no better comforter or companion than a cup of tea modified with sky-blue milk then the following soliloquy though she gave it not breath passed through her brain so here i am then after six months trial of the travelling system and a multitude of experiments in fashionable society just seven hundred pounds poorer than when i set out and without having advanced a single inch towards a second marriage this will never do my youth my beauty and my fortune will all melt away together before the object is obtained unless i change my plans and find some better mode of proceeding here mrs barnaby sipped her vile tea opened her work-box that she had been constrained to leave so hastily ascertained that the exquisite collar she was working had received no injury during her absence and then resumed her meditations hey ho it is most horribly dull sitting in this way all by one's self even that good-for-nothing stupid ungrateful lagness was better to look at than nothing and even in that horrid fleet there was some pleasure in knowing that there was an elegant interesting man to be met in a passage now and then whose eyes spoke plainly enough what he thought of me poor fellow his being in misfortune ought not to produce ill-will to him in a generous mind how he looked as he said adieu then madam with you vanishes the last ray of light that will ever reach my heart and i am sure he said exactly what he felt and no more poor o'donagough my heart aches for him and here she fell into a very piteous and sentimental mood indeed had her soliloquy been spoken out loud as words could utter it nobody would have heard a syllable about love marriage or any such nonsense her heart was at this time altogether given up to pity compassion and a deep sense of the duties of a christian and before she went to bed she had reasoned herself very satisfactorily into the conviction that as a tender-hearted woman and a believer it was her bounden duty now that she had got out of trouble herself to return to the fleet for the purpose of once more seeing mr o'donagough and inquiring whether it was in her power to do anything to serve him before she left london nothing more surely tends to soothe the spirits and calm the agitated nerves than an amiable and pious resolution taken as this was done during the last waning hours of the day and just before the languid body lays itself down to rest mrs barnaby slept like a top after coming to the determination that let the turnkeys think what they would of it she would call at the fleet prison and ask to see mr o'donagough the next morning the following morning came and found the benevolent widow steadfast in her purpose and yet to her honour be it spoken it was not without some struggles with a feeling which many might have called shame but which she conscientiously condemned as pride that she set forth at length upon her adventurous expedition nothing i am sure it was thus she reasoned with herself nothing in the world could induce me to take such a step but a feeling that it was my duty heaven knows i have had many follies in my day i don't deny it i am no hardened sinner and that blessed book that he lent me has not been a pearl thrown to swine the sinner's reward what a comforting title i don't hope ever to be the saint that the pious author describes but i am sure i shall be a better woman all my life for reading it and the visiting this poor o'donagough is the first act by which i can prove the good it has done me then came some doubts and difficulties respecting the style of toilette which she ought to adopt on so peculiar an occasion it won't do for a person looking like a woman of fashion to drive up to the fleet prison and ask to see such a man as o'donagough he is too young and handsome to make it respectable but after all what does it signify what people say and as for my bonnet i'll just put my brussels lace veil on my black and pink that will hide my ringlets and make me look more matronly in her deep lace veil then and with a large silk cloak which concealed the becoming gaiety of her morning dress mrs barnaby presented herself before the gate she had so lately passed and in a very demure voice said to the keeper of it i wish to be permitted to see mr o'donagough the fellow looked at her and smiled 
well madam he replied i believe there will be no difficulty about that walk on if you please you'll find them as can send you forward a few more barriers passed and a few more well-amused turnkeys propitiated and mrs barnaby stood before a door which she knew as well as any of them opened upon the solitary abode of the broken-hearted but elegant mr o'donagough the door was thrown open for her to enter but she paused desiring her usher to deliver her card first with an intimation that she wished to speak to the gentleman on business she was not kept long in suspense for the voice of the solitary inmate was heard from within saying in soft and melancholy accents it is very heavenly kindness beg her to walk in and in she walked the room door being immediately closed behind her mr o'donagough was a very handsome man of about thirty years of age with a physiognomy and cerebral development which might have puzzled dr comb himself for impressions left by the past were so evidently fading away before the active operation of the present that to say distinctly from the examining eye or the examining finger what manner of man he was would have been exceedingly difficult but the powers of the historian and biographer are less limited and their record shall be given mr patrick o'donagough was but a half-breed and that a mongrel half of the noble species which his names announce he was the natural son of an englishman of wealth and consequence by a poor irish girl called nora o'donagough and though his father did what was considered by many as very much for him he never permitted him to assume his name the young o'donagough was placed as a clerk to one of the police magistrates of the metropolis and showed great ability in the readiness with which he soon executed the business that passed through his hands he not only learned to know by sight every rogue and roguess that appeared at the office but showed a very uncommon degree of sagacity as to their innocence or guilt upon every new occasion that enforced their appearance there his noble father never entirely lost sight of him and finding his abilities so remarkable he was induced again to use his interest in those quarters where influence abides and to get him promoted to a lucrative situation in a custom-house on the coast where he made money rapidly while his handsome person and good address gave him access to the society of many people greatly his superiors in station who most of them were frequenting a fashionable watering-place at no great distance from the station where he was employed this lasted for a few years much to the satisfaction of his illustrious parent and it might have continued till an easy fortune was assured to him had he not unluckily formed too great an intimacy with one or two vastly gentlemanlike but decidedly sporting characters from this point his star began to descend till step by step he had lost his money his appointment his father's favour and his own freedom having lain in prison for debt during some weeks he found means again to touch the heart of his father so effectually as to induce him to pay his debts and restore him to freedom upon condition however of his immediately setting off for australia with five hundred pounds in his pocket and with the understanding that he was never more to return the promise was given and the five hundred pounds received but the young man was not proof against temptation he met some old acquaintance lost half his money at Ecarté, and permitted the vessel in which he was to sail to depart without him this was a moment of low spirits and great discouragement but he felt nevertheless that a steadfast heart and bold spirit might bring a man out of as bad a scrape even as that into which he had fallen some people told him to apply again to his father but he thought he had better not and he applied to a gentleman with whom he had made acquaintance in prison instead this person had like himself been reduced to great distress by the turf but having fortunately found means of satisfying the creditor at whose suit he was detained he was now doing exceedingly well as preacher to an independent congregation of ranting fanatics he bestowed on his old associate some excellent advice as to his future principles and conduct giving him to understand that the turf even to those who were the most fortunate never answered so well as the line of business he now followed and assured him moreover that if he would forthwith commence an assiduous study of the principles and practice of the profession he would himself lend him a helping hand to turn it to account o'donagough loved change novelty and excitement and again manifested great talent in the facility with which he mastered the mysteries of this new business he was soon seen rapidly advancing towards lasting wealth and independence one of the wealthiest merchants in london had offered him the place of domestic prayer and preacher at his beautiful residence at castaway saved park when an almost forgotten creditor who had lost sight of him for many years unluckily recognized him as he was delivering a most awakening evening lecture in a large ware-room converted into a chapel near moor fields 
eager to take advantage of this unexpected piece of good fortune the tailor for such was his profession arrested the inspired orator in the first place and then asked him if he were able to settle his account in the next had the manner of transacting the business been reversed it is probable that the affair would have been settled without any arrest at all for sir miles morris of castaway saved park was one of the most pious individuals of the age and would hardly have permitted his chaplain-elect elect in every sense to have gone to prison for thirty-seven pounds nine shillings and eight pence but being in prison o'donagough was shy of mentioning the circumstance to his distinguished patron and was employed at the time mrs barnaby first made acquaintance with him in composing discourses on the preternatural powers over the human mind accorded to the chosen vessels called upon to pour out the doctrine of the new birth to the people there is little doubt that these really eloquent compositions would have sold rapidly and perfectly have answered the object of their clever author but accident prevented the trial from being made for before the projected volume was more than half finished success of another kind overtook mr o'donagough mrs barnaby on entering found the poor prisoner she had so charitably come to visit seated at a writing-desk with many sheets of closely written manuscript about it he rose as she entered and approached her with a judicious mixture of respectful deference and ardent gratitude may heaven reward you madam for this blessed proof of christian feeling how can i suitably speak my gratitude i do assure you mr o'donagough that you are quite right in thinking that i come wholly and solely from a christian spirit and a wish to do my duty said mrs barnaby mr o'donagough looked extremely handsome as he answered with a melancholy smile alas madam what other motive could the whole world offer excepting obedience to the will of heaven sufficiently strong to bring such a person as i now look upon voluntarily within these fearful walls that is very true indeed there is nothing else that could make one do it heaven knows i suffered too much when i was here myself to feel any inclination for returning but i thought mr o'donagough that it would be very unfeeling in me who witnessed your distress to turn my back upon you when my own troubles are past and over and so i am come mr o'donagough to ask if i can be of any use to you in any way before i set off upon my travels for i intend to make a tour to france and perhaps to rome the widow looked at mr o'donagough's eyes to see how he took the news for somehow or other she could not help fancying that the poor young man would feel more forlorn and miserable still when he heard that not only the walls of the fleet prison but the english channel was to divide them nor did the expression of the eyes she thus examined lessen this idea a settled gentle melancholy seemed to rise from his heart and peep out upon her through these windows of the soul to france to rome a deep sigh followed and for a minute or two the young man remained with his eyes mournfully fixed on her face he then rose up and stepping across the narrow space occupied by the table that stood between them he took her hand and in a deep sweet voice that almost seemed breaking into a sob he said may you be happy whithersoever you go my prayers shall follow you my ardent prayers shall be unceasingly breathed to heaven for your safety and my blessing my fervent tender blessing shall hover round you as you go mrs barnaby was exceedingly affected don't speak so pray don't speak so mr o'donagough she said in a voice which gave her very good reason to believe that tears were coming i am sure i would pray for you too when i am far away if it would do you any good and here one of her worked pocket handkerchiefs was really drawn out and applied to her eyes if mrs barnaby exclaimed the young man fervently if oh do not doubt it do not for a moment doubt that i should feel the influence of it in every nerve let me teach you to understand me mrs barnaby for i have made an examination into the effects of spiritual sympathies the subject of much study lay your hand upon my heart nay let it rest there for a moment and you will be able to comprehend what i would explain to you does not that poor heart beat and throb mrs barnaby and think you that it would have fluttered thus had you not said that you would pray for me then can you doubt that if indeed you should still remember the unhappy o'donagough as you pursue your jocund course o'er hill and vale if indeed you should breathe a prayer to heaven for his welfare can you doubt that it will fall upon him like the soft fanning of a seraph's wing and heal the tumult of his soul e'en in this dungeon <laughs> 
there was so much apparent sincerity as well as tenderness in what the young man uttered that a feeling of conviction at once found its way to the understanding of mrs barnaby and little doubt if any remained on her mind as to the efficacy of her prayers indeed mr o'donagough i will pray for you then and i'm sure i should be a very wicked wretch if i did not but is there nothing else i could do to comfort you mr o'donagough had often found his handsome and expressive countenance of great service to him and so he did now no answer he could have given in words to this kind question could have produced so great effect as the look with which he received it mrs barnaby was fluttered agitated and did not quite know what to do or say next but mr o'donagough did he rose from his chair and raising his arms above his head to their utmost length he passionately clasped his hands and stood thus his fine eyes communing with the ceiling just long enough to give the widow time to be aware that he certainly was the very handsomest young man in the world and then he drew his chair close beside her took her hand and fixed those fine eyes very particularly upon hers comfort me he murmured in a soft whisper which had it not been breathed very close to her ear would probably have been lost comfort me you ask if you could comfort me oh earth oh heaven bear witness as i swear that to trace one single movement of pity on that lovely face would go farther towards healing every sorrow of my soul than all the wealth that plutus could pour on me though it should come in ingots of gold heavy enough to break the chains that hold me oh mr o'donagough was all mrs barnaby could utter but she turned her face away nor was the fascinating prisoner again indulged with a full view of it though he endeavoured to make his eyes follow the way hers led till he dropped down on his knees before her and by taking possession of both her hands enabled himself to pursue his interesting speculations upon its expression in spite of all she could do to prevent it this brought the business for which mrs barnaby came namely the inquiry into what she could do to be serviceable to mr o'donagough before she left london to a very speedy termination for with this fair index of what he might say before his eyes the enterprising prisoner ventured to hint that nothing would so effectually soothe his sorrows as the love of the charming being who had already expressed such melting pity for him he moreover made it manifest that if she would with the noble confidence which he was sure made a part of her admirable character lend him wherewithal to liquidate the paltry debt for which he had been so treacherously arrested he could find means again to interest his noble father in his behalf and by giving him such a guarantee for his future steadiness as an honourable attachment was always sure to offer he should easily induce him to renew his intention of fitting him out handsomely for an expedition to australia to which as he confessed he was more strongly inclined than even to persevere in listening to the call he had received to the ministry notwithstanding the tender agitation into which such a conversation must inevitably throw every lady who would listen to it mrs barnaby did not so completely lose her presence of mind as not to remember that it would be better to look about her a little before she positively promised to marry and accompany to australia the captivating young man who knelt at her feet but this praiseworthy degree of caution did not prevent her from immediately deciding upon granting him the loan he desired nay with thoughtful kindness she herself suggested that it might be more convenient to make the sum lent forty pounds instead of thirty-seven pounds nine shilling eight pence and having said this with a look and manner the most touching she at length induced mr o'donagough to rise and after a few such expressions of tender gratitude as the occasion called for they parted the widow promising to deliver to him with her own fair hands on the morrow the sum necessary for his release while he as he fervently kissed her hand declared that deeply as he felt this generous kindness he should wish it had never been extended to him unless the freedom thus regained were rendered dear to his soul by her sharing it with him give me time dear o'donagough give me time to think of this startling proposal and to-morrow we will meet again were the words in which she replied to him and then permitting herself for one moment to return the tender glances he threw after her she opened the room door and passed through it too much engrossed by her own thoughts hopes wishes and speculations to heed the variety of amusing grimaces by which the various turnkeys hailed her regress through them it would be unreasonable for any one to desire better sympathy than that which existed between my heroine and mr o'donagough when they thus tore themselves asunder 
he remaining endurance vile till such time as fate or love should release him and she to throw herself into a hackney coach there to meditate on the pleasures and the pains either promised or threatened by the proposal she had just received the sympathy lay in this that both parties were determined to inform themselves very particularly of the worldly condition of the other before they advanced one step farther towards matrimony for which state though the gentleman had spoken with rapture and the lady had listened with softness both had too proper a respect to think of entering upon it unadvisedly End of chapter nine volume three chapters ten and eleven of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten gives some account of colonel hubert's return to cheltenham we must now follow colonel hubert to cheltenham to which place he returned in a state of mind not particularly easy to be described the barrier he had placed before his heart the heavy pressure of which he had sometimes felt to be intolerable was now broken down and it was a relief to him to remember that agnes knew of his love but excepting this relief there was little that could be felt as consolatory and much that was decidedly painful in his state of mind he knew but too well that not all the partial affection esteem and admiration entertained for him by his aunt would prevent her feeling and expressing the most violent aversion to his marrying the niece of mrs barnaby he knew too what sort of reception the avowal of such an intention was likely to meet from his amiable but proud brother-in-law and remembered with feelings not very closely allied to satisfaction the charge he had commissioned lady stephenson to give him that he should keep watch over his thoughtless young brother in order to guard him if possible from bringing upon them the greatest misfortune that could befall a family such as theirs namely the introducing an inferior connection into it neither could he forget the influence he had used in consequence of this injunction to crush the ardent generous uncalculating attachment of his confiding friend frederick for her whom in defiance of the wishes of his whole family he was now fully determined to make his wife all this gave materials for very painful meditation and when in addition to it he recalled those fearful words of agnes i will never be your wife it required all the power of that master passion which had seized upon his heart to keep him steady to his resolution of communicating his wishes and intentions to lady elizabeth and to sustain his hopes of engaging her actively to assist him in obtaining what he felt very sure she would earnestly desire that he should never possess with all these heavy thoughts working within him he entered the drawing-room of his aunt and rejoiced to find her tete-a-tete -tete with his sister sir edward being absent at a dinner-party of gentlemen they both welcomed him with eager inquiries concerning their young favourite the tone of which at once determined him to enter immediately upon the tremendous subject of his hopes and wishes and the affectionate interest expressed for her warmed him into a degree of confidence which he was far from feeling when he entered the room pretty creature exclaimed lady elizabeth and that wretched woman has actually left her alone in london lodgings why did you not make her return with you montague it was surely no time to stand upon etiquette i dared not even ask it replied colonel hubert his voice faltering and his manner such as to make the two ladies exchange a hasty glance with each other you dared not ask agnes willoughby poor little thing to come down with you to my house colonel hubert said the old lady you surely forget that you went up to london with an invitation for her in your pocket my dear aunt replied colonel hubert hesitating in his speech as neither of his auditors had ever before heard him hesitate i have much to tell you respecting both agnes willoughby and myself then tell it in heaven's name said lady elizabeth sharply let it be what it may i would rather hear it than be kept hanging thus by the ears between the possible and impossible colonel hubert moved his chair and seating himself beside lady stephenson took her hand as if to show that she too was to listen to what he was about to say though it was their aunt to whom he addressed himself from suspense at least i can relieve you lady elizabeth and you too my dear emily who look at me so anxiously without saying a word at least i can relieve you from suspense i love miss willoughby and i hope with as little delay as possible to make her my wife lady stephenson pressed his hand and said nothing but a deep sigh escaped her lady elizabeth who was not accustomed to manifest her feelings so gently 
rose from her seat on the sofa and placing herself immediately before him said with great vehemence montague hubert son of my dead sister you are come to years of discretion and a trifle beyond your magnificent estate of thirteen hundred a year and i beg your pardon some odd pounds shillings and pence over is all your own and you may marry mrs barnaby herself if you please and settle it upon her no one living that i know of has any power to prevent it but sir if you expect that lady elizabeth norris will ever receive as her niece a girl artful enough to conceal from me and from your sister the fact that she was engaged to you and that too while receiving from both of us the most flattering attention nay such affection as might have opened any heart not made of brass and steel if you expect this you will find yourself altogether mistaken this harangue which her ladyship intended to be overpoweringly severe was in fact very nearly the most agreeable one that colonel hubert could have listened to for it touched only on a subject of offence that he was perfectly able to remove all embarrassment immediately disappeared from his manner and springing up to place himself between his aunt and the door to which she was approaching with stately steps he said in a voice almost of exultation my dearest aunt how like your noble self it is to have made this objection before every other and this objection which would indeed have been fatal to every hope of my happiness i can remove by a single word agnes was as ignorant of my love for her as you and emily could be till last night i have loved her longer it may be than i have known it myself perhaps i might date it from the first hour i saw her but she knew nothing of it last night for the first time i confessed to her my love and what think you lady elizabeth was her answer nay mr benedict i know not i thank you sir and a low courtesy i suppose i was less happy lady elizabeth he replied half smiling adding a moment later however with a countenance from which all trace of gaiety had passed away the answer of miss willoughby to my offer of marriage was colonel hubert i can never be your wife indeed then how comes it montague that you still talk of making her so because before i left her i thought i saw some ground for hope that her refusal was not caused by any personal dislike to me really interrupted lady elizabeth nay my dear aunt resumed hubert you may in your kind and long enduring partiality fancy this impossible but unhappily for my peace of that moment i remembered that i was more than five-and-thirty and she not quite eighteen but she told you i suppose that you were still a very handsome fellow only she had some other objection and pray what was it sir she feared the connection would be displeasing to you and lady stephenson and you assured her most earnestly perhaps that she was mistaken no lady elizabeth i did not there are circumstances in her position that must make my marrying her appear objectionable to my family and though my little independence is as your ladyship observes my own i would not wish to share it with any woman who would be indifferent to their reception of her all my hope therefore rest in the confidence i feel that when the first unpleasing surprise of this avowal shall have passed away you both of you for there is no one else whose approbation i should wait for you will suffer your hearts and heads to strike a fair and reasonable balance between all that my sweet agnes has in her favour and all she has against her do this lady elizabeth but do it as kindly as you can emily will help you to-morrow morning you shall tell me your decision i can resolve on nothing till i hear it colonel hubert as soon as he had said this left the room nor did they see him again that night the morning came and he met lady stephenson at the breakfast-table but lady elizabeth did not appear sending down word as was not unusual with her that she should take her chocolate in her own room sir edward was not in the room when he entered and he seized the opportunity to utter a hasty and abrupt inquiry as to the answer he might expect from herself and their aunt from me montague she replied you cannot fear to hear anything very harshly disagreeable in truth i have been so long accustomed to believe that whatever my brother did or wished to do was wisest best that it would be very difficult for me to think otherwise now besides i cannot deny though perhaps it hardly ought to be taken into the account that i too am very much in love with agnes willoughby and that though i would give my little finger she had no aunt barnaby belonging to her 
i never saw any woman in any rank whom i could so cordially love and welcome as a sister in reply to this colonel hubert clasped the lovely speaker to his heart and before he had released her from his embrace or repeated his inquiry concerning lady elizabeth sir edward stephenson entered and the conversation became general for many hours of that irksome morning colonel hubert was kept in the most tantalizing state of suspense by the prolonged absence of the old lady from the drawing-room but at length after sir edward and his lady had set off for their second morning ramble without him he was cheered by the appearance of the ancient maiden who was his aunt's tirewoman bringing in her lap-dog and the velvet cushion that was its appendage which having placed reverently before the fire she moved the favourite fauteuil an inch one way and the little table that ever stood beside it an inch the other and was retiring when colonel hubert said is my aunt coming immediately mitchell my lady will not be long colonel but her ladyship is very poorly this morning and with a graceful swinging courtesy she withdrew the colonel trembled all over very poorly as applied to lady elizabeth norris having from his earliest recollection always been considered as synonymous to very cross she will refuse to see her thought he pacing the room in violent agitation and in that case she will keep her word she will never be my wife bless me how you do shake the room colonel hubert said a very crabbed voice behind him just after he had passed the door in his perturbed promenade if you took such a fancy early in the morning when the housemaid might sweep up the dust you had raised i should not object to it for it is very like having one's carpet beat but just as i am coming to sit down here it is very disagreeable indeed this grumble lasted just long enough to allow the old lady who looked as if she had been eating crab-apples and walked as if she had suddenly been seized with the gout in all her joints to place herself in her easy-chair as she concluded it during which time the colonel stood still upon the hearth-rug with his eyes anxiously fixed upon the venerable but very hostile features that were approaching him a moment's silence followed during which the old lady looked up in his face with the most provoking expression imaginable for cross as it was there was a glance of playful malice in it that seemed to say you look as if you were going to cry colonel he felt provoked with her and this gave him courage may i beg of you lady elizabeth to tell me what i may hope from your kindness on the subject i mentioned to you last night said he pray sir do you remember your grandfather was her reply the earl of archdale yes madam perfectly you do humph and your paternal grandfather with his pedigree from duke nigel of normandy did you ever hear of him yes lady elizabeth replied the colonel in a tone of indifference i have heard of him but he died you know when i was very young there was a minute's silence which was broken by another question from lady elizabeth and pray sir will you do me the favour to tell me who was the grandfather of miss willoughby i have little or indeed no doubt lady elizabeth that miss willoughby is the granddaughter of that mr willoughby of greatfield park in warwickshire who lost the tremendous stake at piquet that you have heard of and two of whose daughters married the twin sons of lord eastcombe i think you cannot have forgotten the circumstances lady elizabeth drew herself forward in her chair and fixing her eyes steadfastly on the face of her nephew said in a voice of great severity do you mean to assert to me colonel montague hubert that agnes willoughby is niece to lady eastcombe and the honourable mrs nivett i mean to assert to you madam that it is my firm persuasion that such will prove to be the fact but i have not considered it necessary lady elizabeth norris for the son of my father to withhold his affections from the chosen of his heart till he was assured he should gain all the honour by the selection which a union with lady eastcombe's niece could bestow nor should i have mentioned my belief in this connection by way of a set-off to the equally near claim of mrs barnaby had you not questioned me so particularly had colonel hubert studied his answer for a twelve month he could not have composed a more judicious one there was a spice of hauteur in it by no means uncongenial to the old lady's feelings and there was too enough of defiance to make her take counsel with herself as to whether it would be wise to vex him further it was therefore less with the accent of mockery and more with that of curiosity that she recommenced her interrogatory will you tell me montague from what source you derive this knowledge of miss willoughby's family was it from herself certainly not if the facts be as i have stated and as i hope and believe they will be found miss willoughby will be as much surprised by the discovery as your ladyship 
from whom then did you hear it from no one lady elizabeth as a matter of fact connected with agnes but something i know not what introduced the mention of old willoughby's wild stake at piquet at the club the other day the name struck me and i led old major barnes to talk to me of the family he told me that a younger son a gay harem scarum sort of youth married some girl when he was in country quarters whom his family would not receive that ruined and broken-hearted by this desertion he went abroad almost immediately after his marriage and has never been heard of since and this is the foundation upon which you build your hope that mrs barnaby's niece is also the niece of lady eastcombe ingenious certainly colonel as a theory but somewhat slight as an edifice on which to hang any weighty matter don't you think so i hang nothing on it lady elizabeth if i did not feel that miss willoughby was calculated to make me happy without this supposed relationship i certainly should not think her so with it however that your ladyship may not fancy my imagination more fertile than it really is i must add that when at clifton i did hear from the mrs peters whom i have before mentioned to you that the father of agnes went abroad after his marriage and moreover that no news of him in any way ever reached his wife's family afterwards lady elizabeth for some time made no reply but seemed to ponder upon this statement very earnestly at length she said in a tone from which irony and harshness levity and severity were equally banished montague there are some of the feelings which you have just expressed in which i cannot sympathize but a very little reflection will teach you that there is no ground of offence to you in this for it would be unnatural that i should do so you tell me that your father's son need not deem the honour of a relationship to viscountess eastcombe necessary to his happiness in life so far i am able to comprehend you although lady eastcombe is an honourable and excellent personage whose near connection with a young lady would be no contemptible advantage at least in my mind upon her introduction into life but we will pass this when however you proceed to tell me that your choice in marriage could in no wise be affected by the rank and station of those with whom it might bring you in contact and that too when the question is whether a mrs barnaby or a lady eastcombe should be in the foreground of the group you must excuse me if i cannot follow you nothing is so distressing in an argument as to have a burst of a grandiloquent sentiment set aside by a few words of common sense colonel hubert walked the length of the drawing-room and back again before he answered he felt that as his aunt put the case he was as far from following his assertion by his judgment as herself but ere his walk was finished the image of the desolate agnes as he had seen her the night before arose before him and resumed its unconquerable influence on his heart he took a hint from her ladyship threw aside all mixture of heat and anger and replied heaven forbid lady elizabeth that i should attempt to defend any such doctrine believe me it is not mine but in one word i love miss willoughby and if i can arrive at the happiness of believing that i am loved in return nothing but her own refusal will prevent me from marrying her this is my statement of facts i will attempt no other and throw myself wholly upon your judgment to smooth or render more rugged the path which lies before me the old lady looked at him and smiled very kindly montague said she resolve my doubts is it the mention of your pleasant suspicions respecting miss willoughby's paternal ancestry or your present unvarnished frankness that has won upon me upon my honour i could not answer this question myself but certain it is that i do feel more inclined to remember what a very sweet creature agnes is at this moment than i ever thought i should again when our conversation began colonel hubert kneeled down upon her footstool and kissing her hand said in a voice that spoke his happiness it matters not to me what the cause is my dearest aunt i thank heaven for the effect and now do not think that i am taking an unfair advantage of this kindness if i ask you to remember the position of miss willoughby at this moment with such views for the future as i have explained to you is it not my duty to remove her from it what then do you propose to do demanded lady elizabeth i can do nothing he replied whatever aid or protection can be extended to her must come from you or lady stephenson and that i should rather it came from you who have long been to me as a mother can hardly surprise you sir edward is an excellent young man but he has prejudices that i should not like to battle with on this occasion it is from you and you only lady elizabeth that i either hope or wish to find protection for my future wife 
again lady elizabeth pondered did not agnes tell us she said at length did she not say in her letter to lady stephenson that she had applied to some aged relation in devonshire by whom she hoped to be extricated from her present terrible embarrassment it is very likely replied colonel hubert for she spoke to me of such a one and hoped that thursday that is to-morrow is it not would bring an answer to her application then montague we must wait to hear what this thursday brings forth before we interfere to repeat the offer of protection which it is possible she may not want and heaven grant it may be so for if she is to be your wife colonel hubert and it is pretty plain she will be will it not be better that you should follow her with your addresses to the lowliest roof in devonshire than that she should take refuge here where every gossip's finger will be pointed at her it was impossible to deny the truth of this and colonel hubert cared not to avow that all the favour she had bid him hope for was but conditional and that till the avowal of his love should be sanctioned by his aunt and sister he was still to hold himself as a rejected man he dared not tell her this lest the feelings he had conquered with so much difficulty should return upon learning that it was not yet too late to encourage them as patiently as he could therefore he awaited the expected letter from agnes and well was he rewarded for doing so the letter itself modest and unboastful as it was gave a sufficiently improved picture of her condition to remove all present anxiety on her account and though he certainly had no idea of the transformation she had undergone from a heart-broken penniless dependent into a petted cherished heiress he was soothed into the belief that it would now cost his aunt and sister infinitely less pain than he had anticipated to extend such a degree of favour to his agnes as might lead her to confirm the hope on which he lived but it was not the letter of agnes that produced the most favourable impression upon lady elizabeth the postscript of miss compton was infinitely more powerful in its effect upon her mind of agnes personally she never thought without a degree of partial admiration that nearly approached to affection and vague as the hope was respecting the family of her father it clung very pertinaciously to the old lady's memory while a certain resemblance which she felt sure that she could trace between the nose of agnes and that of the honourable miss nivett lord eastcombe's eldest daughter was doing wonders in her mind by way of a balance weight against the rouge and ringlets of mrs barnaby yet nevertheless the notion that not horrid mrs barnaby only but a host of aunts and cousins of the same breed might come down upon her in the event of this ill-assorted marriage kept her in a sort of feverish wavering state something between good and ill-humour that was exceedingly annoying to her nephew the keen-sighted old lady at once perceived that the postscript to agnes's letter was not written by a second mrs barnaby and from that moment she determined much more decisively than she chose to express that she would torment colonel hubert with no farther opposition after a short consultation between the aunt and niece that letter was dispatched the receipt of which was mentioned before miss compton and agnes left london for clifton had colonel hubert been consulted upon it he would perhaps have suggested as an improvement that the proposed meeting should take place the following week in london but on the whole the composition was too satisfactory for him to venture upon any alteration of it and again he called patience to his aid while many miserably long days were wasted by the very slow and deliberate style in which the man and maid servant who managed all lady elizabeth's worldly concerns set about preparing themselves and her for this removal it was with a degree of pleasure which almost atoned for the vexation of this delay that he learned sir edward's good-natured compliance with his beautiful bride's capricious seeming wish of revisiting clifton colonel hubert pertinaciously refused to let his gay brother-in-law into his confidence till the time arrived for presenting him to miss willoughby as to his future wife did this reserve arise from some unacknowledged doubt whether agnes when the pressure of misfortune was withdrawn would voluntarily bestow herself on a man of his advanced age perhaps so that agnes was less than eighteen and himself more than thirty-five were facts repeated to himself too often for his tranquillity chapter eleven agnes appears at clifton in a new character at as early an hour on the morning after her arrival at clifton as agnes could hope to find her friend mary awake she set off for rodney place it was a short walk but a happy one even though she had yet to learn whether lady elizabeth norris and her party were or were not arrived but there was something at the bottom of her heart that made her very tolerably easy more so perhaps than she confessed to herself on this point 
every day made the mysterious fact of miss compton's being a woman of handsome fortune more familiar to her and every hour made it more clear that she had no other object in life than to make that fortune contribute to the happiness of her niece it followed therefore that not having altogether forgotten the fact of colonel hubert's declaration at a moment when all things but his own heart must have pleaded against her some very comfortable ground for hope to rest upon was discoverable in the circumstances of her present position there will be no danger thought she that when he speaks again my answer should be such as to make him fancy himself too old for me the servant at rodney place who opened the door to agnes was the same who had done her the like service some dozen of times during her last visit at clifton but he betrayed no sign of recognition when she presented herself in fact the general appearance of agnes was so greatly changed from what he had been accustomed to see it when she was clothed in the residuum of the widow barnaby's weeds that till she smiled and spoke her inquiry for miss peters he had no recollection of her as soon however as he discovered that it was the miss willoughby who had left all his ladies crying when she went away he took care to make her perceive that she was not forgotten by the manner in which he said miss peters ma'am is not come downstairs yet but she will be very happy to see you ma'am if you will please to walk up as the early visitor was of the same opinion she scrupled not to find her way to the well-known door and without even the ceremony of a tap presented herself to her friend it is probable that mary looked more at the face and less at the dress of the visitor than the servant had done for uttering a cry of joy she sprang towards her and most affectionately folded her in a cordial embrace my sweet agnes this is so like you at the very instant you entered i was calculating the probabilities between to-day and to-morrow for your arrival ah oh, little girl did i not tell you to address yourself to miss compton of compton bassett long ago what say you to my wisdom now that you were inspired mary and that i deserved to suffer a good deal for not listening to such an oracle but had i done so i should never have known the difference between the extreme of barnaby misery and compton comfort said mary finishing the sentence for her agnes blushed but said with a happy smile yes assuredly i may say so miss peters looked at her and laughed there is something else you would not have known i am very sure agnes by that conscious face and it must be something very well worth knowing by that look of radiant happiness which i never saw on your face before no not even when for the first time you looked down upon avon's dun stream for then if i remember rightly your joy showed itself in tears but now my dear you are dimpling with smiles though i really believe you are doing all you can to hide them from me say why is this wherefore what should it mean mary there is not an event of my life nor a thought of my heart that i would wish to hide from you but how can i begin telling you such very long and incredible stories as i have got to tell just as you have finished dressing and are ready to go down to breakfast said agnes breakfast replied her friend i would rather go without breakfast for a month and not hear the beginning middle and end of all your adventures from the moment you left this house in crape and bombasine with your cheeks as white as marble and your eyes full of tears up to this present now that you have entered it again in as elegant a morning toilette as london can furnish with your cheeks full of dimples and your eyes dancing in your head with happiness notwithstanding all your efforts to look demure come sit down agnes and tell me all tell you all i will depend upon it but not now dear mary think of all your mother's kindness to me shall i sit here indulging in confidential gossip with you instead of paying my compliments to her and the rest of the family in the breakfast-room no positively no so come downstairs with me directly or i will go myself aunt compton is spoiling you child that is quite clear you used to be obedient to my command and ever ready to do as i desired but now you lay down the law like a lord chancellor come along then miss agnes but remember that as soon as breakfast is over i expect first to be taken to the mall have i not got nice lodgings for you and introduced to miss compton of compton bassett and then taken to our old seat on the rock then and there to hear all that has befallen you to this agnes agreed and they descended together the interest and the pleasure that her entrance excited among the family group already assembled round the breakfast-table was very gratifying to her mrs peters seemed hardly less delighted than mary the two girls kissed her affectionately and gazed at her with as much admiration as astonishment which is tantamount to saying that they admired her much 
good mr peters welcomed her very cordially and inquired with the most scrupulous politeness for the health of mrs barnaby and james told her very frankly that he was delighted to see her and that she was fifty times handsomer than ever the conversation that followed was perfectly frank on the part of agnes in all that related to the kindness of her aunt compton and the happiness she enjoyed from being under her care but from delicacy to them she said as little as possible about mrs barnaby and from delicacy to herself made no mention whatever either of colonel hubert or his family as soon as the breakfast was over mrs peters declared her intention of immediately waiting on miss compton an attention to her aunt which agnes welcomed with pleasure though it still farther postponed the much wished for conversation with her friend mary the whole family declared their eagerness to be introduced to the old lady of whom miss willoughby spoke with such enthusiasm but as the discreet mrs peters declared that at this first visit her eldest daughter only must accompany her the rest yielded of necessity and the three ladies set out together i expect to find this new aunt a much more agreeable personage my dear agnes than your former chaperone though she was my dear sister but on one point i flatter myself i shall find them alike i hope this point of resemblance is not of much importance to your happiness my dear mrs peters replied agnes for if it be you are in a bad way since night and day are infinitely less unlike than my two aunts in all things yes but it is of great importance to my happiness particularly for this evening agnes replied mrs peters the point of resemblance i want to find is in the trusting you to my care we are going to a party this evening where i should particularly like to take you and it will be impossible you know to arrange exchange of visits and manage that an invitation shall be sent and accepted by aunt compton on such very short notice do you think she will let you go with us ask her my dear mrs peters replied agnes with a very happy smile and see what she will say to it i will if i do not find her too awful was the answer the manner in which miss compton received and entertained her visitors was a fresh source of surprise to agnes though thinking very highly of her intellect and even of her conversational powers she had anticipated some symptoms of reserve and shyness on the introduction of so perfect a recluse to strangers but nothing of the kind appeared miss compton was pleased by the appearance and manner of both mother and daughter and permitted them to perceive that she was so rather with the easy flattering sort of courtesy with which a superior treats those whom he wishes should be pleased with him than with any appearance of the mauvaise honte which might have been expected nor must this be condemned as unnatural for it was in fact the inevitable result of the state of mind in which she had lived with keen intellect elastic animal spirits and a position that places the owner of it fairly above the reach of annoyance from any one an elevation by the by that a few of the great ones of the earth can boast it is not an introduction to any ordinary society that can discompose the mind or agitate the manners mrs peters did not find aunt compton too awful and therefore preferred her request which like every other that could have been made likely to promote the pleasure of agnes was not only graciously but gratefully complied with a question being started as to the order in which the party should go mrs peters carriage not being able to take them all at once miss compton settled it by saying agnes has her own carriage and servants here but she must not go alone and perhaps if she calls at your house mrs peters you will have the kindness to let her friend mary accompany her and permit her carriage to follow yours this being settled mrs peters and her daughter rose to take leave and mary then hoped that agnes by returning with them would at length give her the opportunity she so earnestly desired of hearing all she had to tell but she was again disappointed for when the young heiress asked her indulgent aunt whether she would not take advantage of the lovely morning to see some of the beauties of clifton she replied i should like nothing so well agnes as to take a drive with you over the beautiful downs you talk of will you spare her to me for so long miss peters i think you deserve a little of her miss compton answered the young lady and with the hope of the evening before me i will enter no protest against the morning drive the mother and daughter then took their leave and as they left the house they exchanged a glance that seemed to express mutual congratulation on the altered condition of their favourite well mamma you will be rewarded this time for obeying my commands like a dutiful mother and permitting me to make a pet of the sweet agnes there is nothing in the barnaby style here i was sure miss compton of compton bassett must be good for something said mary if i may venture to hope as i think i may replied her mother 
that she will never be the means of bringing me in contact with my incomparable sister-in-law again i may really thank you saucy girl as you are for having so taken the reins into your own hands i delight in this miss compton there is a racy originality about her that is very awakening and as for your agnes what with her new young happiness her graceful loveliness now first seen to some advantage her proud and pretty fondness for her aunt and her natural joy at seeing us all again under circumstances so delightfully altered i really do think she is the most enchanting creature i ever beheld End of chapters ten and eleven volume three chapter twelve of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve a party a meeting good sometimes productive of evil the superintending the toilette of agnes for the party of that evening was a new and very delightful page in the history of the spinster of compton bassett the fondest mother dressing a fair daughter for her first presentation never watched the operations of the toilette more anxiously and in her case there was a sort of personal triumph attending its success that combined the joy of the accomplished artist who sees the finished loveliness himself has made with the fond approval of affection partly from her own native good taste and partly from the wisdom of listening with a very discriminating judgment to the practical counsels of an experienced modiste the dress of agnes was exactly what it ought to have been and the proud old lady herself could not have desired an appearance more distingue than that of her adopted child when turning from peggy and her mirror she made a sportive courtesy and exclaimed have you not made a fine lady of me aunt betsy when miss compton's carriage stopped at rodney place it was mrs peters instead of her daughter who took a place in it mary is excessively angry with me said she as they drove off for not letting her be your companion but i think it more comme il faut agnes that i should present you to mrs pemberton myself she is a vastly fine lady not one of us humble bristolian cliftonites who pique ourselves rather upon the elevation of our limestone rock above the level of the stream that leaves our merchants quays than on any other species of superiority that we can lay claim to mrs pemberton is none of us she has a house in london and a park in buckinghamshire and flies over the continent every now and then with first-rate aristocratical velocity but she has one feeling sometimes shared by more ordinary mortals which is a prodigious love of music this and a sort of besoin to which she pleads guilty of holding a salon every evening that she is not from home forces upon her as i take it the necessity of visiting many of us who might elsewhere scarcely be deemed worthy to approach her footstool we met her at the parslow's where the girl's performances elicited a very gracious degree of approbation an introduction followed she has honoured me by attending a concert in my own house and this is the fourth evening we have passed with her now you have the carte du pays and i think you will agree with me that it is much better i should make my entree with you on my arm than permit you to follow with the damsels in my train agnes confessed that she thought the arrangement much more conducive to the dignity of her approach and thanked her companion for her thoughtful attention perhaps it is not quite disinterested agnes i am rather proud of having such an exotic to produce what a delightful aunt compton it is carriage perfect servants evidently town made white satin and blonde fit for an incipient duchess if your little head be not turned agnes you will deserve to be chronicled as a miracle i have had enough to study the giddiest craft that ever was launched my dear mrs peters replied agnes and it would be silly indeed to throw my ballast overboard because i am sailing before the wind then your head is not turned that is what you mean to say is it not no replied agnes laughing my head is not turned i feel almost sure of it but why do you make such particular inquiries respecting the state of my head at present mrs peters shall i be called upon to give some illustrious proof of its healthy condition to-night yes my dear you will assuredly be called upon to sing and you must prove to my satisfaction that you are not grown too fine to oblige your friends is that all depend upon it i will do whatever you wish me mrs pemberton's drawing-room was full of company when they entered it but that lady espied them the moment they arrived and stepped forward with so much eagerness to receive them that agnes thought mrs peters had in her account of the acquaintance between them hardly done justice to the degree of favour she had risen to 
but a few minutes more convinced her that even she unknown as she was might flatter herself that some portion of this distinguished reception was intended for her for mrs pemberton took her hand and led her to a seat at the upper end of the room with an air of such marked distinction as spite of the philosophy of which she had just been boasting brought a very bright flush to her cheeks if it did not turn her head a few words however spoken by that lady to one of those beside whom she placed her explained the mystery and proved that mrs peters had deemed it prudent to intimate her intention of bringing a young friend with her beforehand miss eversham you must permit me to introduce this young lady to you miss willoughby miss eversham from a little word in mrs peters note this morning i flatter myself that i shall have the gratification of hearing you sing together this lady's voice is a contralto miss willoughby and from what i have heard of your performance at mrs peters before i had the pleasure of being acquainted with her your voices will be delightful together this most unexpected address was not calculated to restore the composure of agnes and it was not without some effort that she summoned courage enough to answer the numerous questions of miss eversham an elderly young lady too much inured to exhibition to have any mercy upon her when as an excuse for withdrawing her attention for a moment from the ceaseless catechism that tormented her she turned away her eyes to look upon the company and beheld the profile of colonel hubert as he bent to speak to a lady seated on a sofa near which she stood this was not an occurrence very likely to restore her composure but at least it spared her any farther anxiety respecting the effort necessary for receiving the attentions of her neighbour properly for she altogether forgot her vicinity and became as completely incapable of hearing her farther questions as of answering them had he seen her did he know she was at clifton was his aunt was lady stephenson there how would he address her would their intercourse begin from the point at which it had broken off or would her altered circumstances by placing each in a new position lead to a renewed proposal and an answer oh how different from her former one these were the questions that now addressed themselves to her making her utterly incapable of hearing the continued string of musical interrogatories which went on beside her the short interval during which colonel hubert retained his attitude and continued his conversation seemed an age and expectation was growing sick and almost merging in despair when at last the lady turned to answer a question from her neighbour and colonel hubert stood upright and cast his eyes upon the company her emotion was too powerful to permit bashfulness to take any part in it she sought his eye and met it in a moment all suffering was over and all anxiety a thousandfold overpaid for the look she encountered was all her heart could wish at the first glance indeed he evidently did not know her it was that of a wandering speculative eye that seemed looking out for occupation and had she quite understood it aright she might have perceived that it was arrested by a sort of sudden suspicion that it had found something worth pausing upon but this lasted not above the tenth part of an instant and then he darted forward his fine proud countenance expressive of uncontrollable agitation and the rapidity with which he approached her was such as to show pretty plainly that he forgot it was a crowded drawing-room he was traversing by the time he reached her however short as the interval was the glow that had lighted up her face when it first arrested his eye had faded into extreme paleness and when he spoke to her she trembled so violently as to be quite unable to articulate colonel hubert perceived her agitation and felt that it approached in some degree to his own had he been twenty-five this would have probably been all he wished to see as it was he felt a dreadful spasm at the heart as the hateful thought occurred that after what had passed there might be two ways in which it might be interpreted but it was a passing pang and longing to present her to his aunt and sister and at the same time release her from the embarrassing curiosity so conspicuous in the manner of her neighbour he held the hand she extended to him while he said let me lead you to lady elizabeth miss willoughby both she and lady stephenson are in the next room and will be delighted to see you agnes rose and though really hardly able to stand replied with all the voice she had that she should be greatly obliged if he would lead her to them taking his offered arm as she spoke at this moment sir edward stephenson crossed the room with his eyes fixed upon her and with evident curiosity to find out who it was his stately brother-in-law was escorting so obsequiously the extreme beauty of agnes and the remarkable elegance of her dress and appearance had in truth already drawn all eyes upon her and the whispered enquiries of many had been answered by mrs pemberton with the information that she was an heiress and the first amateur singer in england 
the foundation of these assertions had reached her by the note of the judicious mrs peters who while asking permission to bring a young friend took the opportunity of hinting the two interesting facts above mentioned and the effect of their repetition among her guests doubtless added not a little to the interest with which agnes was looked at sir edward stephenson was among those who had heard of the heiress ship and the voice but the name had not reached him and while looking at the elegant girl in white satin who leant upon colonel hubert's arm not the slightest resemblance between her and the fair girl in deep mourning that he had once or twice seen at cheltenham occurred to him there was a stoppage in the doorway between the two rooms and it was at this moment sir edward said in the ear of the colonel who is your fair friend do you not know her sir edward it is miss willoughby what the girl the person we saw at nonsense montague who is it colonel hubert shrugged his shoulders at the incredulity of his brother-in-law and quietly replying i have told you all that i know took advantage of a movement among the crowd in the doorway and led his fair companion through it in the short interval occasioned by this stoppage agnes so far recovered her composure as to become very keenly alive to the importance of the next few moments to her happiness should lady elizabeth look harshly or lady stephenson coldly upon her of what avail would be all the blessings that fate and affection had showered upon her favoured head and then it was that for the first time she felt the full extent of all she owed to miss compton for the consciousness that she was no longer a penniless desolate dependent came to her mind at that moment with a feeling ten thousand times more welcome than any display of her aunt's hoarded wealth had ever brought and the recollection that in speaking of her to mrs peters miss compton had almost pompously called her my heiress and the inheritor of my paternal acres and some twenty thousand pounds besides which at the time had in some sort been painful for her to listen to was at that agitating moment recalled with a degree of satisfaction that might have been strangely misinterpreted had those around been aware of it some might have traced the feeling to pride and some to vain self-consequence but in truth it arose from a deep-seated sense of humility that blessed anything likely to lessen the awful distance she felt between herself and hubert in the eyes of his relations but with all the aid she could draw from such considerations her cheek was colourless and her eyes full of tears when she found herself standing almost like a culprit before the dignified old lady whose favour she had once gained in a manner so unhoped for whom she feared she had deeply offended since and on whose present feelings towards her hung all her hopes of happiness in life it was not at the first glance that her timid but inquiring eye could learn her sentence for the expressive countenance of the old lady underwent more than one change before she spoke at first it very unequivocally indicated astonishment then came a smile that as plainly told of admiration at which moment by the way her ladyship became impressed with the firmest conviction that the nose of the honourable miss nivett and that of miss willoughby were formed on the same model and at last whatever intention of reserve might have possessed her it all melted away and she held out both her hands with both aspect and words of very cordial welcome the heart of agnes gave a bound as these words reached her and the look of animated happiness which succeeded to the pale melancholy that sat upon her features when she first approached touched the old lady so sensibly that nothing but the presence of the crowd around prevented her throwing her arms around her in a fond embrace lady stephenson was from the first instant all affectionate kindness and even sir edward who had hitherto never appeared to think it necessary that his lady's singing favourite should occupy much of his attention now put himself forward to claim her acquaintance apologising for not having known her at first by saying the change of dress miss willoughby must be my excuse you have left off mourning since i saw you last agnes smiled and bowed and appeared not to have been in the least degree affronted in fact she was at that moment too happy to be otherwise than pleased with everybody in the world meanwhile colonel hubert stood looking at her with love admiration and astonishment that fully equalled that of his aunt but the contemplation did not bring him happiness without settling the balance very accurately in his own mind perhaps he had hitherto felt conscious that his station and fortune independent at least if not large might be set against her youth that constant stumbling-block of his felicity and her surpassing beauty but there was something in the change from simplicity of dress that almost approached to homeliness to the costly elegance of costume that was now before him which seemed to indicate a position to which his own no longer presented so very favourable a contrast 
she no longer appeared to be the agnes to obtain whom he must make a sacrifice that would prove beyond all doubt the vastness of his love and he trembled as he beheld her the principal object of attention and the theme of avowed admiration throughout the room lady elizabeth very unceremoniously made room for her next herself by desiring a gentleman who occupied the seat beside her which was on a small sofa filling the recess by the chimney to leave it i beg a thousand pardons sir but i see no other place in the room where we could hope for a space to sit thus tete a tete together and did you know how near and dear she was to me you would i am sure excuse me the gentleman though not a young one assured her with the appearance of much sincerity that to yield a seat to such a young lady could be considered only as honour and happiness by every man having thus established her restored favourite at her side lady elizabeth began to whisper innumerable questions about miss compton how came it my dear said she that when opening your heart to emily and me upon the subject of your unfortunate situation with mrs barnaby you never referred to the possibility of placing yourself under the protection of miss compton because my aunt compton having quarrelled with my aunt barnaby had refused to take any further notice of me mrs barnaby at least led me to believe during the six or seven months i passed with her that every application on my part to miss compton would be vain and it was only the dreadful predicament into which mrs barnaby's arrest threw me that gave me the desperate courage which i thought necessary for applying to her but i have since learned lady elizabeth that at any time one word from me would have sufficed to make her leave her retirement as she now has done and remove me from my dreadful situation but it appears that she is not only a kind aunt but a wealthy one my dear child excuse the observation agnes situated as we now are together you cannot deem it impertinent but your dress indicates as great and as favourable a change in pecuniary matters as your letter and your happy countenance announces in all others miss compton i presume is a woman of fortune her fortune is larger than i imagined it to be replied agnes she lived with great economy before she adopted me and do you know what her intentions are agnes rejoined the persevering old lady it is only as the aunt of colonel hubert remember this my dear it is only as colonel hubert's aunt that i asked the question agnes blushed with most happy consciousness as she replied the interest you so kindly take in me confers both honour and happiness and however averse to boast of the kindness bestowed and promised by my dear aunt i can have no wish to hide from you lady elizabeth all she has said to me she knows the honour that has been done me by colonel hubert and knows too that nothing but the fear of your displeasure could have made me hesitate to accept it and she says that should no such displeasure interfere she would bestow a fortune on me well my dear i don't believe that any such displeasure is likely to interfere when will you introduce us to her to-morrow lady elizabeth agnes eagerly replied if you will give us leave to wait upon you yes that is right my dear quite right she must call on me first and yet i am not quite sure of that either i rather think the friends of the gentleman should wait upon the friends of the lady and so i will call upon her to-morrow morning and remember when you have introduced us to each other you may go away we must talk on business what is her address agnes gave the address very distinctly which was repeated in the same manner by lady elizabeth just as mrs pemberton approached to entreat her permission to lead her to the pianoforte you are going to sing my dear child very good i shall be delighted to hear you and you must get me a place where i can both look at and listen to her mrs pemberton said lady elizabeth considerably surprised but much pleased to find that the acquaintance she had condescended to make with mrs peters had led her to having the honour of receiving so intimate a friend and favourite of her most illustrious guest mrs pemberton rather ostentatiously performed the service required of her and agnes once more stood up to sing with lady elizabeth's armchair almost as near to her as on the happy night when she first won the old lady's heart at cheltenham but where was colonel hubert he had stood so anxiously watching the first few words that passed between his aunt and agnes and when he saw her cavalier dismission of her neighbour and the cordial style of amity with which she pursued her conversation with the beautiful interloper he almost forgot his doubts and fears in the happiness of seeing one obstacle so decidedly removed and prudently denying himself the pleasure of being near them lest his presence might render the conversation less confidential he withdrew to the other room and only appeared again before the eyes of agnes when he took his place beside her to turn over the pages of her song <laughs> 
for the first few moments agnes feared that she was too happy to sing but she tried and found that her voice was clear and was determined that it should soon be steady for she wished let youthful ladies judge how ardently to renew the impression which she had made on colonel hubert on that never-to-be-forgotten morning when she first dared to fancy he loved her nor were her wishes vain she sang as well and he felt as strongly as before her pleasure as she watched this was perfect but his was very far from being so he saw that she was the centre of attraction and not only as before the admired of every eye and the enchanter of every ear but also the most distinguished fashionable and important young lady present there was not however a shadow of the paltry feeling called jealousy in this the pang that smote his heart arose from memory and not from imagination could he as he now saw this elegant girl the centre of fashion and the petted favourite of his own proud aunt forget the generous devoted passion of the unfortunate frederick could he forget that he had used all the influence which the young man's affection to himself had lent him to make him abandon an attachment so every way calculated to ensure his happiness could he forget that frederick was now living an exile from his country the victim of unhappy love while he his trusted confidant but most pernicious adviser remained to profit by the absence he himself had caused and to drain the cup of happiness which his hand had dashed from the lips of his wretched friend as long as mrs barnaby continued to hang about her and in some degree to overshadow her with the disgrace of her vulgar levity agnes could not be loved without a sacrifice and the youth and splendid fortune of frederick stephenson as well as the peculiarly strong feelings of his family on the subject might have stood as reasons why another less fettered by circumstances might have married her though he could not but how stood the matter now agnes had been snatched from mrs barnaby and borne completely beyond the sphere of her influence stephenson's proud brother seemed to bow before her while his wife selected her as a chosen friend and worse a thousand times worse than all the rest he had learnt while he wandered among the company before the music commenced that agnes was the proclaimed heiress of fifteen hundred a year this last however for his comfort he did not believe but there was enough without it to make him feel that should he even be so blessed as to teach her to forget the difference of their age and make her young heart his own he must by becoming her husband appear to the friend who had trusted him as one of the various traitors under heaven such thoughts were enough to jar the sweetest harmony and the evening was altogether productive of more pain than pleasure to the unfortunate colonel hubert who having staked his happiness on a marriage only to be obtained by the consent of his aunt was now suffering martyrdom from a plethora of success and would have gladly changed his condition back to what it had been regardless of consequences he had laid his heart at the feet of agnes by the light of her one tallow candle in half moon street while her sole protectress lay imprisoned in the fleet when the party broke up colonel hubert leaving his aunt to the care of sir edward escorted mrs peters and the four young ladies downstairs where another shock awaited him on hearing her servant inquire which carriage should be called up first for before answering mrs peters turned to agnes and said to which name are your servants accustomed to answer my dear miss compton told me you would have your own carriage here but perhaps this might only be another mode of saying you would have hers shall they call miss compton's carriage or miss willoughby's agnes they will answer to either i believe replied agnes carelessly for she was waiting for colonel hubert to finish something he was saying to her call miss willoughby's carriage then said mrs peters to the servants in waiting and miss willoughby's carriage miss willoughby's carriage resounded along the hall and through the street End of chapter twelve volume three chapter thirteen of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen demonstrating the heavy sorrow which may be produced by a young lady's having a larger fortune than her lover expected miss compton was not long kept waiting for the appearance of her promised visitor on the following morning for before twelve o'clock lady elizabeth norris arrived agnes very punctually obeyed the commands that had been given her and having properly introduced the two old ladies to each other left them together and hastened at length to satisfy the anxious curiosity of her friend mary by giving her a full account of all the circumstances that had led to the happy change in her prospects her tale was listened to with unbroken attention and when it was ended miss peters exclaimed now then i forgive you agnes and only now for not returning the love of that very pleasant person frederick stephenson 
for i do believe it is nearly impossible for a young lady to be in love with two gentlemen at once and i now perceive beyond the shadow of a doubt that the superb colonel turned your head from the very first moment that you looked not upon but up to him how very strange it is she continued that i should never have suspected the cause of that remarkable refusal i imagine my dullness arose from my humility i was conscious myself that i should quite as soon have taken the liberty of falling in love with the autocrat of all the russias as with colonel hubert and it therefore never occurred to me that you could be guilty of such audacity nevertheless i will not deny that he is a husband to be proud of and so i wish you joy heartily but do tell me she added after a moment's meditation how do you mean to manage about mr stephenson your first meeting will be rather awkward will it not i fear so replied agnes gravely but there is no help for it and i must get over it as well as i can fortunately none of the family have the slightest idea of any such thing and i hope they never will i hope so too dear but it would be very unpleasant would it not if upon hearing what is going on he were to burst in among you and insist upon shooting colonel hubert this was said playfully and without a shadow of serious meaning but it rendered agnes extremely uneasy and it required some skill and perseverance on the part of miss peters to remove the effect of what she had said there were however too many pleasant points of discourse among the multitude of subjects before them for her young spirits to cling long to the only one that seemed capable of giving her pain and on the whole their long and uninterrupted conference was highly gratifying to them both while this was going on in rodney place something of the same kind but without any drawback at all was proceeding in the mall between the two old ladies the result of which may be given more shortly by relating what passed between lady elizabeth and her nephew afterwards than by following them through the whole of their very interesting but somewhat desultory conversation colonel hubert was awaiting the return of his aunt with much anxiety an anxiety by the way which proceeded wholly from the fear that what she might have to report should prove his agnes to be a meilleur parti than he wished to find her this singular species of uneasiness was in no degree lessened by the aspect of the old lady as she entered the drawing-room in which he was waiting to receive her this is a very singular romance montague as ever i remember to have heard of she began here is this pretty creature who was introduced to us as niece and adopted child as i fancied of the vulgarest and most atrociously absurd woman in england without money or wit enough to keep her out of jail and now she turns out to be a young lady of large fortune perfectly well educated and well descended on both sides of her house and all this too without any ledger domain denouement or discoveries i wish you joy heartily montague her fortune is exactly what was wanted to make yours comfortable she has fifteen hundred a year part of which is by miss compton's account a very improvable estate in devonshire but i suspect the old lady will like to give a name to your second son or should you have no second son to a daughter nor can i blame her for this by her account compton of compton bassett has endured long enough in the land to render the wish that it should not pass away a very reasonable one especially for the person who holds and has to bequeath the estate to which it has for centuries been annexed so that point i presume you will not cavil at you must take care however that the liberal-minded old gentlewoman in making this noble settlement on her niece does not leave herself too bare she talked of the trifle that would follow at her death this ought not to be a trifle and were i you montague i would insist that the amount settled on agnes at your marriage should not exceed one thousand a year this with the next step in your profession will make your income a very sufficient one even without the regiment which you have such fair reason to hope for during the whole of this harangue colonel hubert was suffering very severely till by the time her ladyship had concluded his imagination became so morbidly alive that he almost fancied himself already in the presence of his injured friend he fancied him hastening home to be a witness at his marriage and gazing with a cold reproachful eye as the beauty the wealth the connections of agnes were all shown to be exactly what his friends would have approved for him had not a false a base and interested adviser contrived to render vain his generous and honourable love that he might win the precious prize himself what a picture was this for such a mind as hubert's to contemplate had not lady elizabeth been exceedingly occupied by the curious and unexpected discovery she had made concerning the race and the rents of the comptons she must have perceived how greatly the effect of her statement was the reverse of pleasurable to her auditor 
but in truth her attention was not fixed upon him but upon miss compton whom she considered as one of the most remarkable originals she had ever met with and ceased not to congratulate herself upon the happy chance which had turned her yielding kindness to her nephew into a source of so much interesting speculation to herself receiving no answer to the speech she had made she added very good-humouredly that's all mr benedict now you may depart to look for the young lady and you may tell her if you please that upon the whole i very much doubt if the united kingdoms might not be ransacked through without finding any one i should more completely approve in all ways as the wife of montague hubert poor sir edward how he will wish that all his anxieties respecting his hare-brained brother had been brought to a termination by the young man's having had the wit to fall in love with this sweet girl instead of you but i doubt if frederick stephenson has sufficient taste and refinement of mind to appreciate such a girl as agnes he probably overlooked her altogether or perhaps amused himself more by quizzing the absurdities of the aunt than by paying any particular attention to her delicate and unobtrusive niece it required such a mind as yours montague to overcome all the apparent obstacles and objections with which she was surrounded i honour you for it and so perhaps will your giddy-headed friend too when he comes to know her she is a gem that we shall all have reason to be proud of colonel hubert could bear no more but muttering something about wishing immediately to write letters he hurried out of the room and shut himself into the parlour which had been appropriated to his morning use without giving himself time to think very deliberately of the comparative good and evil that might ensue he seized a pen and wrote the following letter to mr stephenson dear frederick we parted painfully and my regard for you is too sincere for me to endure the idea of meeting you again with equal pain i have had reason since you left england to believe that notwithstanding the very objectionable manners and conduct of mrs barnaby her niece miss willoughby is in every way worthy of the attachment you conceived for her nay that her family and fortune are such as even your brother and sisters would approve i will not conceal from you that there are others who have discovered though not so early as yourself the attractions and the merits of miss willoughby but who can say frederick that if your early and generous devotion were made known to her she might not give you the preference over those who were less prompt in surrendering their affections than yourself if then your feelings towards her continue to be the same as when we parted at our breakfast-table at clifton and this i cannot doubt for agnes is not formed to be loved once and then forgotten if you still love her frederick hasten home and take the advantage which your early conceived and unhesitating affection gives you over those who saw her more than once before they discovered how important she was to their happiness notwithstanding the impatience with which you listened to my remonstrances on the subject of a connection with mrs barnaby i believe that they were in truth the cause of your abandoning a pursuit in which your heart was deeply interested and so believing i cannot rest till i have told you that a marriage with miss willoughby no longer involves the necessity of any personal intercourse with mrs barnaby they are separated and probably for ever believe me now and for ever very faithfully your friend montague hubert the effort necessary for writing and dispatching this letter by the post was of service to him it tended to make him feel more reconciled to himself and less impatient under the infliction of hearing the favoured position of miss willoughby descanted upon but much anxiety much suffering still remained how should he again meet agnes despite a thousand dear suspicions to the contrary he could not wholly conquer the belief that it was her indifference or some feeling connected with the disparity of their age which dictated the two well-remembered words i will never be your wife and his best consolation under the terrible idea that he had recalled a rival to compete with him arose from the feeling that if when his own proposals and those of frederick were both before her she should bestow herself on him he might and must believe that spite of his thirty-five years she loved him but though he hailed such comfort as might be got from this it could not enable him to see agnes while this uncertainty remained without such a degree of restraint as must convert all intercourse with her into misery agnes meanwhile was indulging herself with all the happy confidence of youthful friendship in relating to her friend everything that had happened since they parted and returned to them all soon after lady elizabeth had left it with a heart glowing with love gratitude hope and joy the narrative with which miss compton welcomed her was just all she wished and expected and when told that the evening was to be passed at the lodgings of lady elizabeth norris 
she thanked the delighted old lady for the intelligence with a kiss that spoke her gladness better than any words could have done the evening came and found the aunt and niece ready to keep their engagement with such an equality of happiness expressed in the countenance of each as might leave a doubtful which enjoyed the prospect of it the most the pretty dress of agnes with all its simplicity was rather more studied than usual and it was the consciousness of this perhaps which occasioned her to blush so beautifully when miss compton made her a laughing compliment about the delicate style of it you look like a lily my agnes said the old lady gazing at her with fond admiration you have certainly got very tired of black my dear child for i perceive that whenever you wish to look very nice you select unmixed white for your decoration i think it best expresses the change in my condition replied agnes oh my dear aunt how very very happy you have made me nothing could be more gratifying than the manner in which they were received by lady elizabeth lady stephenson and sir edward but colonel hubert was not in the drawing-room when they entered for a short time however his absence was not regretted even by agnes as she was not sorry for the opportunity it gave her of receiving the affectionate congratulations of her future sister and it was with a feeling likely to produce much lasting love between them that the one related and the other listened to the history of colonel hubert's return from london of his first bold avowal of his love to his aunt and of the comfort he had found in the reception given this avowal by lady stephenson herself but still colonel hubert came not and at length lady elizabeth exclaimed with a spice of her usual vivacity upon my word i believe that montague is writing an account of his felicity to every officer in the british army he darted out of the room this morning before i had half finished what i had to say to him he hardly spoke three words while dinner lasted and off he was again as soon as the cloth was removed and each time something about writing letters was the only intelligible words i got from him i wish you would go sir edward and see if he is writing letters now and i will ring for tea i mean to make montague sing to-night with agnes emily has taken care that you should have a good piano my dear and you must take care that while i stay here i have music enough to make up for the loss of my menagerie for i don't think i shall begin collecting again just yet sir edward obeyed the old lady's wishes and when the tea was half over returned with his brother-in-law this was the first time that colonel hubert had been seen by miss compton and the moment was not a favourable one for removing the idea which she had originally conceived of his being too old for the lover and husband of her beautiful niece he was looking pale harassed and fatigued but while agnes feared only that he might be unwell her aunt though she could not deny that he was a gentleman of a most noble presence it was thus she expressed herself in speaking of him to mrs peters thought that it was strange so young a girl should have fixed her fancy upon him in preference to all the world beside in fact miss compton's notions of a lover being drawn solely from the imaginary models she had made acquaintance with among her bees and flowers she would have been better pleased to see a bright-eyed youth of twenty-one as the hero of her own romance than the dignified but melancholy man who now stood before her having received his salutation and returned it with that tone and look of intelligent cheerfulness which redeemed all she said from any imputation of want of polish or deficiency of high-bred elegance she turned her eyes on the face of agnes and there she read such speaking testimony of love and admiration that all her romantic wishes for her perfect bliss were satisfied and following the direction of those speaking eyes and once more examining the features and person of hubert she satisfied herself by the conviction that if not young he was supremely elegant and that if his complexion had lost its bloom his manners had attained a degree of dignity superior as she thought to anything described among the young gentlemen whose images were familiar to her imagination it was slowly that colonel hubert approached agnes and mournfully that he gazed upon her but there was to her feelings a pleasure in his presence which for a long time prevented her being fully conscious that he on his part was not so happy as she had hoped it was in her power to make him by degrees however the conviction of this sad truth made its way to her heart and from that moment her joy and gladness faded drooped and died away like a flower into which a gnawing worm has found its way and nestled in the very core this did not happen on this first evening of their meeting under the roof of lady elizabeth for agnes indulged her with every song she desired to hear lady stephenson sang too nor could colonel hubert refuse to join them so that to the unsuspicious agnes that evening seemed delightful 
but a silent melancholy walk on the following morning made her ask herself where was the ardent love for which he had pleaded in half moon street had she mistaken him when he said that his happiness depended wholly on her and if not what was it had turned him thus to stone poor agnes she could have no confidant in this new sorrow her aunt compton and her friend mary had both spoken of him as too old to be a lover and did she breathe to either a fear that his affection had already grown cold might they not tell her that it was but natural such words she thought would break her heart for every hour he became dearer to her than before as she saw he was unhappy and thinking more of him than of herself mourned more for his sorrow of which she knew nothing than for her own though it was rapidly undermining her health and destroying her bloom End of chapter thirteen volume three chapter fourteen of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen returns to mrs barnaby and relates some of the most interesting and instructive scenes of her life together with several circumstances relative to one dearer to her than herself the real heroine of this love story has been left too long and it is necessary we should return to see in what way her generous friendship for mr o'donagough was likely to end having kept her promise and paid the debt for which he had been detained as well as comforted him by the farther loan of two pounds ten shilling four pence she stated to him her intention of remaining for a month longer at her lodgings in half moon street adding with a degree of naivete that o'donagough felt to be extremely touching let this be a month of probation my dear friend for us both we met under circumstances too much calculated to soften the heart for either of us perhaps to be able fairly to judge how we may feel when those circumstances are past let me see as much of you as your occupations will permit i shall dine at five o'clock because the evenings are drawing in and i don't love candlelight before dinner you will always find a steak or a chop and a little brandy and water or something of that sort and now adieu this is a disagreeable place to pay or receive visits in and i flatter myself that i now leave it for ever let the most glowing gratitude that heart can feel be set forth in words of fluent eloquence such as befit the class to which mr o'donagough belonged and the answer which he gave to this speech will be the product nevertheless mr o'donagough knew what it meant perfectly well it meant that the widow barnaby although she had made up her mind to give herself and whatever she might happen to possess to a husband and although she was exceedingly well inclined to let that husband be mr patrick o'donagough she did not intend to go thus far in manifesting her favour towards him without knowing a little more than she did at present respecting the state of his affairs in a word he perceived as he repeated to himself with an approving smile that though on marriage she was bent she had a prudent mind nor was he notwithstanding the little irregularities into which he had heretofore fallen unworthy of becoming an object of tender attention to mrs barnaby much as he admired her he had steeled his soul to the virtuous resolution of putting a sudden stop to all farther intercourse between them should he find upon inquiry that prudence did not justify its continuance whatever deficiency of wisdom therefore the conduct of either had before shown it was evident that both were now actuated by a praiseworthy spirit of forethought that ought to have ensured the felicity of their future years it will be evident to all who study the state of the widow's mind at this period that she had considerably lowered the tone of her hopes and expectations from the moment she became aware of the defection of lord mucklebury the shock which her hopes had received by the disagreeable denouement of her engagement with major allen had been perfectly cured at least for a time by the devotion of the noble viscount and so well satisfied was she herself at an escape which had left her free to aim at a quarry so infinitely higher that what had been a mortification turned to a triumph and she enjoyed the idea that when she seemed to slip she had so gloriously recovered herself as to leave mrs peters and other envious wonderers cause to exclaim she rises higher half her length but from the time this coroneted bubble burst her courage fell her arrest was another blow mr morrison's desertion one heavier still and little as she cared for agnes or in truth for anybody living but herself the manner of her departure vexed and humbled her that crooked hag thinks she has made me truckle to her she exclaimed as her aunt and her niece drove off on the night that agnes first took up her abode with miss compton 
she thinks that because she spent some of her beggar's money to hire a carriage in order to bully me i shall count myself despised and forsaken but the spiteful old maid shall hear of my being married again and that will be wormwood i'll answer for it it was in this spirit that she set about inquiring into the private character and prospects of young mr o'donagough and her first step in the business showed at once her judgment and her zeal in the history he had given of himself he had spoken of a certain most respectable bookseller who as he modestly hinted knowing his worth and the exemplary manner in which he had turned from horse-racing to preaching had exerted himself in the kindest manner to obtain some situation for him that should atone for the severity of his father it was to him he had owed the engagement as domestic chaplain in the family of the nobleman formerly mentioned and it was to him mrs barnaby addressed herself for information that might lead to an engagement of still greater importance it was not however her purpose that her real object should be known and she therefore framed her inquiries in such a manner as to lead mr newbirth to suppose that her object was to obtain either a teacher or a preacher for her family circle having made it known that she wished a few minutes private conversation with the principal she was shown into a parlour by one of the clerks and civilly requested to sit down for a few minutes till mr newbirth could wait upon her it must be the fault of every individual so placed if such few minutes have not turned to good account for the table of this exemplary publisher was covered elbow deep in tracts sermons missionary reports mystical magazines and the like but as mrs barnaby was not habitually a reader she did not profit so much as she might have done by her situation and before mr newbirth's arrival had begun to think the few minutes mentioned by his clerk were unusually long ones at length however he appeared and then it was impossible to think she had waited too long for him for the gentle suavity of his demeanour made even a moment of his presence invaluable you have business with me madam he said with his heels gracefully fixed together and his person bent forward in humble salutation as far as was consistent with the safety of his nose pray do not rise i have now five minutes that i can spare without neglecting any serious duty and so saying he placed himself opposite to the lady in act to listen i have taken the liberty of waiting upon you sir replied mrs barnaby a little alarmed at the hint that her business must be completed in the space of five minutes in order to make some inquiries respecting a mr o'donagough who is i believe known to you mr o'donagough the reverend mr o'donagough madam the widow though well disposed to enlarge her knowledge and extend the limits of her principles was not yet fully initiated into the mysteries of regenerated ordinations and therefore replied as the daughter of an english clergyman might well be excused for doing no sir the gentleman i mean is mr patrick o'donagough he was not brought up to the church but there was something in the phrase brought up to the church that grated against the feelings of mr newbirth and his brow contracted and his voice became exceedingly solemn as he said i know mr patrick o'donagough who like many other shining lights was not brought up to the church but has nevertheless received the title of reverend from the congregation which has the best right to bestow it even that to which he has been called to preach mrs barnaby was not slow in perceiving her mistake and proceeded with her inquiries in such a manner as to prove that she was not unworthy to intercommune either with mr newbirth himself or any of those to whom he extended his patronage the result of the interview was highly satisfactory for though it seemed clear that mr newbirth was aware of the vexatious accident which had for some months checked the young preacher's career it was equally evident that the circumstance made no unfavourable impression and mrs barnaby returned to her lodgings with a pleasing conviction that now at least there could be no danger in giving way to the tender feeling which had so repeatedly beguiled her the rev mr o'donagough would look very well in the paragraph which she was determined should record her marriage in the exeter paper and being quite determined that the three hundred and twenty-seven pounds per annum which still remained of her income should be firmly settled on herself she received her handsome friend when he arrived at the hour of dinner in a manner which showed he had lost nothing in her esteem since they parted it had so happened that within half an hour of the widow's quitting the shop of mr newbirth mr o'donagough entered it his patron received him very graciously and failed not to mention the visit he had received which though not elucidated by the lady's leaving any name was perfectly well understood by the person principally concerned there are some men who might have felt offended by learning that such a means of improving acquaintance had been resorted to but its effect on mr o'donagough was exactly the reverse his respect and estimation for the widow were infinitely increased thereby 
for though still a young man he had considerable experience and he felt assured that if mrs barnaby had not something to bestow besides her fair fat hand she would have been less cautious in letting it follow where it was so certain her heart had gone before the conviction thus logically obtained assisted the progress of the affair very essentially having learnt from mr newbirth that the place he had lost by the ill-timed arrest was filled by another who was not likely to give it up again he once more contrived to make his way to the presence of his father and gave him very clearly to understand that the very best thing he could do would be once more to furnish the means for his departure from europe that you may spend it again at the gaming-table you audacious scamp responded his noble but incensed progenitor no no sir replied the soft-voiced young preacher you are not aware of the change in my principles or you would have no such injurious suspicion as to your principles pat replied his lordship beguiled into a smile by the sanctified solemnity of his versatile son i do not comprehend how you could change them seeing that you never had any then instead of principles sir let me speak of practice it is now several months since i exchanged the race-course the billiard-table and the dice-box for the course of an extemporary preacher i am afraid my lord that your taste rather leads you to performances of a different kind or i would ask you to attend the meeting at which i am to expound next wednesday evening after which you could hardly doubt i imagine the sincerity of my conversation it would be putting your eloquence to rather a severe test master patrick but if you have really got a church to preach in at home why in the devil's name should you bother me again about going abroad because my lord i have no fixed stipend or any other honest and safe means of getting my bread and also because there are many other reasons which make it desirable that i should leave this country that at least is likely enough to be sure mr o'donagough but have the kindness to tell me what security you would give me for taking yourself off if i were again to furnish the means for it this was exactly the point to which the reformed son wished to bring the yielding father for it was not difficult to show many reasons for believing that he was in earnest in his intention to depart with as little delay as possible it was with great caution however that he hinted at the possibility of his taking a lady with him as his wife whose fortune was sufficient to prevent the necessity of his returning again to beg for bread even at the risk of liberty or life for he feared that if he confessed the prosperous state of his matrimonial hopes they might be held sufficient for his necessities but here he was mistaken for no sooner did his father discover that his case was not quite desperate than he manifested a considerable softening and before a fortnight had expired mr o'donagough was able to convince the enamoured widow that in uniting her destiny to his she would be yielding to no sinful weakness but securing both her temporal and eternal felicity on the firmest footing possible and now everything went on in so prosperous a manner as almost to disprove the truth of the oft-quoted assertion of the poet the course of true love never did run smooth for the loves of mr o'donagough and mrs barnaby met with not even a pebble of opposition as they ran evenly on towards matrimony this peaceful and pleasant progress was not a little assisted by a visit which the prudent peer deemed it advisable to make to the intended bride nothing could be more agreeable to the feelings of the lady than this attention nothing more advantageous to the interests of both parties than the result his lordship ascertained to a certainty that the widow had wherewithal to feed his son and most obligingly took care that it should be so secured as to place her fortune beyond the reach of any relapse on his part while the fair lady herself amidst all the gentle sweetness with which she seemed to let his lordship manage everything took excellent care of herself one thing only remained to be settled before the marriage took place and this was the obtaining an appointment as missionary to a congregation newly established in a beautiful part of australia where there was every reason to suppose that a large and brilliant society would soon give as much eclat to the successful efforts of an eloquent preacher as could be hoped for in the most fashionable reunion of saints in the mother country the appointment was in effect left in the hands of one or two whose constant exertions and never let anything escape them habits made them of personal importance in every decision of the kind this little committee agreed to meet at mr newbirth's on a certain evening for the purpose of being introduced to mrs barnaby and it was understood among them that if they found reason to be satisfied with her principles and probable usefulness in a new congregation the appointment should be given to mr o'donagough whose approaching marriage with her was well known to them all 
mrs newbirth who was quite a model of a wife and who therefore shared all her husband's peculiar notions respecting things in heaven and earth very obligingly lent her assistance at this important session both to prevent mrs barnaby's feeling herself awkward as being the only lady present and because it was reasonably supposed that she might be useful in giving the conversation such a turn as should elicit some of the more hidden but not therefore the least important traits of female character it was not intended that either mr o'donagough or his intended bride should be aware of the importance attached to this tea-drinking in mr newbirth's drawing-room but the expectant missionary had not lived thirty years in this wicked world for nothing and though the invitation was given in the most impromptu style possible he instantly suspected that the leaders of the congregation who were about to send out the mission intended to make this an opportunity for discovering what manner of woman the future mrs o'donagough might be considerable anxiety was the consequence of this idea in the mind of mr o'donagough he liked the thoughts of preaching and lecturing to the ladies and gentlemen of model town and therefore determined to spare no pains in preparing the widow for the trial that awaited her he found her by no means unapt at receiving the hints he gave respecting several important articles of faith which although new to her she seemed willing enough to adopt without much inquiry but he had a hard struggle before he could obtain the straightening of a single ringlet or the paling in the slightest degree the tint of her glowing rouge at length however the contest ended by his declaring that without her compliance on this point he should feel it his duty passionately as he adored her to delay their marriage till she could be induced for his sake to conform herself a little more to the customs and manners of the sect to which she belonged mrs barnaby's heart was not proof against such a remonstrance as this her resolution melted into tears and she promised that if he would never utter such cruel words again he should dress her hair himself in any manner he would choose as to my rouge she added i have only worn it my dear o'donagough because i consider it as the appendage of a woman of fashion but i will wear much less that is to say almost none at all for the fashion if such shall be your wish thank you my dear that's all right and i'll never plague you about it after i once get the appointment only do what i bid you to-night and we'll snap our fingers at them afterwards the party assembled at mr newbirth's consisted of himself and his lady and four gentlemen belonging to the congregation which was to be propitiated after the tea and coffee had disappeared mr newbirth who was the only gentleman in the company except her own o'donagough with whom mrs barnaby was personally acquainted opened the conversation by asking if the change of residence which she contemplated from one side of the world to the other was an agreeable prospect to her very much so indeed was the reply i suppose you are aware ma'am observed mr littleton who was senior clerk in a banking-house and the principal lay orator of the congregation i suppose you are aware that you are going among a set of people who though decidedly the most interesting portion of the human race in the eyes of all true christians are nevertheless persons accustomed heretofore to habits of irregular not to say licentious living how do you think ma'am that you shall like to fall into habits of friendship and intimacy with such mr o'donagough listened with a good deal of anxiety for the answer but it was a point on which he had given his affianced bride very ample instructions and she did not disgrace her teacher my notions upon that point sir she replied are rather particular i believe for so far from thinking the worse of my fellow-creatures because they have done wrong i always think that is the very reason why i should seek their company and exert myself in all ways to do them good and to make them take their place among the first and greatest in the kingdom of heaven a murmur of applause ran around the little circle as mrs barnaby concluded her speech and mr littleton in particular expressed his approbation of her sentiments in a manner that inspired the happy o'donagough with the most sanguine hopes of success i never heard better sense or sounder principles or more christian feelings in the whole course of my life than what this lady has now expressed and i will take upon me to say gentlemen without making any new difficulty about the matter that any minister going out to sydney in the holy and reverend character of a missionary sent by an independent congregation of devotional men with such a wife in his hand as this good lady will be sure to make will do more good in his generation than all the bishops and archbishops that ever were consecrated after the manner of the worn-out superstitions of bygone ages gentlemen he continued rising from his chair 
i do therefore forthwith propose the immediate election of the rev patrick o'donagough to the office of missionary from the independent congregation of anti-work christians of london to the independent congregation of anti-work christians at sydney with the privilege and undivided monopoly of tract and hymn selling to the said congregation together with a patent right not royal patent but holy patent to all fees donations contributions and payments of whatsoever kind made by the said independent congregation of anti-work christians at sydney for and on account of the salvation of their souls this gentleman is the resolution i would propose and i trust that some among you will readily be found to second it that sir will i and most joyfully said mr dellant rising for i neither do nor can feel the shadow of a doubt that our beneficent objects in dispatching this mission will be more forwarded by this appointment than by any other it is probable gentlemen i might say possible we could make for where i would ask shall we find another mrs barnaby may we not say in the language of scripture that she is a help meet for him even for the rev patrick o'donagough whom we have chosen mr newbirth followed on the same side giving many unanswerable reasons for believing that nothing which the stiff-necked unconverted obsolete ministers of the church of england could do for the predestined army of saints at present located at sydney could approach in utility and saving efficacy of absolving grace to what might be hoped from the ministry of mr o'donagough assisted by the lady he was so happy as to have engaged to be his wife it gives me the most heartfelt pleasure gentlemen he continued that my little humble drawing-room should have made the scene of this happy election how many souls now most probably grovelling in the lowest depths of vice will have places secured them upon the highest seats of heaven by your work gentlemen begun continued and ended within this one propitious hour i would now propose that we do all stand up and sing a hymn to the glory of sinners made perfect next that we do all kneel down to hear and join in an awakening prayer from our new missionary and finally that we walk into mrs newbirth's back drawing-room there to partake of such creature comforts as she in her care shall have provided this speech was also received with great applause some few pleasant and holy remarks and observations were made by the other gentlemen present and all things proceeded to the happy finale suggested by their host in the most amicable and satisfactory manner so that before mr o'donagough rose to escort mrs barnaby to the coach which was to convey her to half moon street he was given to understand on the indefeasible authority of mr littleton that he might consider himself already as the anti-work missionary elect and might set about the preparations for his marriage and subsequent departure without farther uncertainty or delay mrs barnaby's troubles now seemed really at an end nothing could move onward with a smoother surer pace than did the business which she and her chosen companion had before them the bridegroom's noble father became liberal and kind under the certainty of his clever son's certain departure the lawyers behaved exceedingly well about the settlements influenced perhaps in some degree by the wishes of the peer who as it seemed was almost nervously anxious for the departure of the happy pair the dressmakers worked briskly and a very respectable subscription was raised among the ladies of the independent congregation for the purchase of several elegant little presents for the bride which they thought might prove useful during her voyage in this happy state we will leave our heroine in order to see how matters were proceeding at clifton End of chapter fourteen